warn you, we've had a line of thunderstorms going through here that had been at least a tornado warning previously, but I don't think we're, I think it's dying down by now. So if we see your, see your gear start swirling around behind you, we know that the tornado's hit? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're sending it to us. We appreciate not getting it. Yep, yep. So, uh, well, let's go ahead and start. Um, this is the March 16th, 2021 uh, session of Tangerine SDR and Hamside Technical Session. My name is Dave, KV0S. And this week I've been working on two projects. Uh, one is I have made some progress on the, uh, I did have a meeting with Scotty and Tom, and we, we talked about some things, but uh, basically I have made progress on my um, simulator for progr programming simulator. And I have bits and pieces of the protocol, uh, but this is pre-Bill's protocol. And, um, I think I got it worked out and I got it worked out in a way that the key things are variables. So if you don't like what I propose, we can change them. Um, I did that. And then I'm also working on a tapper project just by the way with, uh, which has to do with the um, whisper transmitters that run on Raspberry Pis. And we're trying to, there are a few issues with running those on Raspberry Pi 4s. So we're working through those. Uh, we, we have clues, but the solutions haven't been completely implemented. So that's it for me. Hey Dave, a uh, quick comment. We actually got that board to work on a Raspberry Pi 0, if that helps you any. I know it'll work on a, a 0. Uh, the... The biggest problem is the code that that's supposed to work on a Raspberry Pi 4 uh, has some uh, copy errors. The C file and the H file don't match. And I first tried one, converting one way for the declarations of the, the file names, and then I ran into some other errors. So I'm going to try it the other way. But I wish I could find the original code that it all came from. But so I'm doing that and I'm working on, um, but we're also working on the um, shutdown procedure, which uh, Dave Witten has helped me a little bit with. So that's that. And next on the list is Nathaniel W2NAF. And I bet he's been working on a meeting. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dave. <laughs> Yes, I've been very busy uh, working on the Hamside workshop. I think we're almost there. Uh, I have a few more details to take care of. So tomorrow is going to be my detailed day for uh, working on that. But I think the posters, the eye posters are in place. I think the oral presenters know what they need to do. The schedule is up on the list. Uh, we had a good practice session this weekend. Uh, I've got my students, I see Veronica's on here. She's been working on her poster. I think things are coming along quite nicely. So I'm really looking forward to it. W2NAF back to that. Very good. Next on the list, we have Bill, AB4EJ. Go ahead, Bill. Thanks, Dave. Good evening to you. Good evening to the net. Um, <clears throat> spent some time working on preparing a demo for the, uh, the HAMSI conference and uh, wasted some time because I, I thought, well, let's see if I, I, I can make a, a nicer demo if I have uh, the program that's running the, uh, running the whole thing, uh, running on a, a machine that I can, where Zoom can run on. Because Zoom won't run on a Raspberry Pi ARM architecture. Certainly, I mean, I've, you try and get that to run with all that other stuff, with all that all that signal processing stuff. The last time I tried, I couldn't even find something that would even run at all. Uh, they didn't have a version available, but I, I'm not, anyway. So finally, after burning several days on that, I, I kicked that out 
and I'm just going to have to aim a camera at the screen. And we tested that over the weekend, and it's 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 okay. Um, other than that, um, I did a little work on the grape. Um, got it to where it will, upon boot up, will automatically uh, get the GPS to sync to get uh, the time and start the new radio and start copying data into digital RF. So that is that is now on the grape uh, for the version two of the software. Um, so presumably we we might be able to use that for the Antarctica project. So anyway, back to net. Fine business. Next on the list, we have uh, another bill in eight E E T go ahead. Yeah, I really haven't been doing anything. I've been meaning to come to these meetings to find out what's going on for a month or so when something has always come up. And tonight I finally remembered and, and had the time all at the same time. So I'm just here tonight to listen and see what's going on. And we'll see you all this weekend. Well, very good, Bill. Glad you made it. <laughs> uh, next on the list, we have Dan in for XW. Go ahead, Dan. Well, thank you, Dave, and uh, good evening, everyone. Haven't uh, really done much the last week. I've been busy, but haven't accomplished much. <laughs> Maybe that's a better way to put it. So um, I do have uh, one thing, I guess, that I don't think I mentioned before. I created a repository just for Tangerine SDR scripts on my uh, GitHub site. So uh, if you want to go there, it's uh, under my call sign N4XWE. And uh, I think I have probably about 15 or 20 scripts there these days. So if you're looking for something to run software or to compile software on uh, a ARM processor of some sort, it's a good source of uh, script information for that. And uh, I guess as an add on, it's possible if even if you're compiling from your desktop with the command line to kind of use the scripts as a reference. They're well commented and all you have to do is copy and paste commands. So back to you, Dave. Well, fine business, Dan. I think that'll be helpful. Next on the list, we have Dave, KD0EAG. Go ahead, Dave. Nothing to discuss. Um, really back over to you. Well, fine business and keep your head down. Uh, next on the list is Dev. Go ahead, Dev. That's me? Yes. Good evening, uh, everyone. So we are Haley and Hati in a very lively spirit here uh, in Scranton, preparing for the Hansai conference workshop. And I'm preparing for my paper presentation. So I'll be preparing on uh, irregularities in the mid-latitude ionosphere. Over the weekend, I read, uh, I tried to read, uh, go through a lot of literature. And as, a, as always, I came back uh, very confused. So thank you. Well, very good. Uh, next on the list, we have Greg, uh, VA3, uh, CBN. Go ahead. Thanks, Dave. I'm still a bit exhausted from helping Eric on the weekend. That was uh, really something. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to this weekend's uh, workshop I'm, and listening to all the good speakers. Back to net. Fine business, and hopefully you'll recover. <laughs> uh, next on the list, we have Homan, uh, KD2MCR. Go ahead. Home. Hello, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so uh, three things. Uh, yeah, likewise, I've been working on the uh, Hansai workshop presentation uh, where I'm, I'm responsible for uh, giving a talk about um, the magnetometer project uh, for science best aspect. So I'm trying to uh, look at data sets that that we obtained from Jenny Jump uh, in combination with the data set that uh, Ju provided. So I'm working on it <clears throat> and I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, people for uh, Hamsai pro uh, project. 
The second one is the, I've been working on uh, the magnetometer in my lab just to see uh, how it performs uh, in general um, in collaboration with Jules uh, and, and Dave. Um, I still need to repeat the, the experiment because it wasn't really going well, or maybe my, my lab is full of noise. So um, I'm trying to compare data with Jules who provided a similar data set. And uh, by just looking at uh, uh, the data set that Jules provided uh, that he performed inside his lab, the, the performance uh, was very satisfactory. I, I'm very uh, glad to see that the, such a low cost magnetometer was performing uh, very decently. So I'm very happy to see that. And I'm, I really appreciate um, Jules and Dave's effort uh, in pushing forward. Um, and I'm, I apologize for Dave and Jules for not responding uh, that quickly because sometimes I'm swamped by emails uh, as usual. And third one is uh, uh, with the discussion with Jules and Dave, uh, we are trying to come up with, so uh, this is actually uh, based on the conversation that I had with Nathaniel that uh, maybe we can come up with maybe slightly better version of magnetometer than maybe the one that we are working on right now because it is satisfactory, but maybe for some serious scientists, we really want to provide like, like better science data set. Uh, maybe we can uh, prepare for slightly better magnetometer. So uh, Jewel, Dave and I are working uh, on, uh, uh, I guess Dave Larson is also involved in that. Um, trying to figure out what other options we have, we could have. So we have some, we have a couple of uh, uh, options or candidate uh, products that we can think of uh, in the price range of say five or 600-ish dollars, uh, you know, hoping that some serious scientists uh, wouldn't mind uh, spending extra dollars uh, for slightly better magnetometer. I mean, not slightly, probably much better uh, for slightly more dollars. So that's something that we are trying to figure out. Uh, but otherwise the, the, the originally proposed uh, magnetometer, we are working on it and so far so good. Uh, I'm very happy to see the progress and the, the level of performance. Back to Net. thank you. Very good. Uh, yes, I've been watching the traffic and it's been quite a bit of activity among this group that he mentioned. Next on the list, we have James, KG4DSG. Go ahead, James. Got me now? Yes. Got nothing new here. I'm just listening in and, and uh, trying to keep up with everybody. That back to net. Fine business. And next on the list, we have Jim, K4BSE. Go ahead, Jim. I don't know if Jim's there. Well, next after Jim. Are you uh, hearing me now? Now we are. Yep. Okay. Sorry, I forgot to press the space bar to turn my mic on. Um, I've been continuing to uh, work on uh, this uh, spreadsheet I've developed, uh, still developing on um, the uh, 5, 10, and 15 megahertz signals and what they might sound like at the uh, South Pole. And uh, found quite a few that uh, could probably be putting in roughly the same order of magnitude uh, signal level down there, depending on propagation. And I've got some several, several questions to ask on that. I, I think that was probably better for the uh, Thursday morning meeting than for this meeting, though. Um, that's about it. Thanks. Well, thanks a lot. And uh, next on the list, we have Jonathan Rizzo, uh, KC3EEY. Go ahead, Jonathan. Hi, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Yes. OK, good. Um, I was having uh, some back and forth discussion with uh, uh, Tom, uh, Scotty, Dave, and um, uh, 
and and uh, also uh, Phil um, about um, importing um, VLF RX tool streams into Digital RF and understanding more about uh, exactly how the um, uh, personal space weather station database will work. Um, but I have some questions. Uh, maybe this, this would be for a general uh, discussion, but um, the one thing that I wanted to know is, is that um, uh, is the plan to continuously um, feed data from all these deployed uh, receivers into the database or is it going to be um, when it's requested or some sort of event only uh, type thing like maybe uh, uh, whisper events or things like that and then with that uh, what would be the plan for the VLF data would would we want um, continuous streams um, into a repository or uh, just events and um, also lightning location. Um, is that going to be a system that we're going to um, have, have live with these VLF receivers? Um, so those are the uh, uh, questions that I had. Um, just to kind of understand what the end goal is here. Uh, back to the net. Well, fine business. And uh, let's, I think we'll, if somebody wants to answer your question, I think they'll be ready to, we might just yeah. wait till the, do you uh, want to answer now? I can talk a little bit about it now and then I can go into it more later. Okay. Um, but, but the brief answer, Jonathan, is we don't have the exact knowledge of what data collection modes we're going to be running just yet and how we're going to do it. I envision that there will be a coordinated data collection mode that for any station that's participating as a full personal space weather station node, they would take directions from central command and they would send the data to wherever it's going. Um, what that mode consists of exactly is yet to be decided. How often say we do uh, chirp soundings, how often we do VLF receiving, how much data we can collect. That's all going to be a function of what the particular science question we're asking at the time is, as well as the capabilities of the uh, particular single board computer it's running on, how many things we can run simultaneously, plus how much bandwidth the available user has. So all of those things need to come into consideration. I'd also say that for people who maybe are VLF enthusiasts and want to say, look, I don't want to be a part of the main, you know, program, you know, this is supposed to be something that an individual can buy and can also do what they want with. So if they decide that I want to run this as a VLF only type of node, they should have the ability to do that and then send the data to where they want to. Um, but We'll be, I think we'll be working on addressing that as time goes on. We can talk about that more in the open discussion. Sounds good. And um, well, we'll finish the list and we can have a more discussion later. Um, next on the list is Jules K2KGJ. And Jules, you've been busy this week. Yes, good evening, Dave and the net. Um, as you know, Dave, uh, by the emails we've had a fair amount of, at least a fair amount of email activity this week. Yes. But uh, what I've been doing is uh, essentially working on improvement of resolution of the RM3100 by fully utilizing uh, its cycle count and in onboard averaging capability to produce the best signal to noise ratio we can get for one uh, sample per second rate. Uh, I've also done some essentially some backyard testing with a Helmholtz pair and a known field level um, square wave uh, drive to see, to try to determine again what the minimum resolution was if, with the new configuration and been trading that information back and forth, as you know, with Hillman and with Dave Witten as well. So the good news is that the potential candidate that Hillman and, and uh, 
Nathaniel had looked at previously uh, in regard to a Fluxgate mag is actually quite compatible with our present setup. We could use without much modification at all, the existing local board, use the CAT5 cable, add a very low power 18-bit or 16-bit three-channel A to D converter at the remote end, along with the present temperature sensor, along with the present uh, 9815 uh, I2C extenders, and uh, integrate this particular magnetometer uh, with that system and do some trials. So again, the good news is it's not going to be a heavy lift to try that alternate sensor out. Uh, back to Ned. So, so uh, quick, quick, quick question. So the remote port has uh, ADC built yes, in already? That is correct. Uh, okay, okay. And, and it's, it's an I2C ADC, very low power, actually only consumes about a milliamp. What, what's the bit number, bit, bit resolution? Uh, well, I, there are two of them possible. One is an 18-bit, uh, the other is a 16-bit. You can actually, 16-bit oh, okay. you, you, gives us a resolution that is uh, below the peak to, or below, yeah, below the RMS, no, below the peak to peak, excuse me, noise of the uh, candidate sensor. Okay, good, good to hear. Well, and fine business. That? Who is that, was that Dave? Uh, this is David McGaw. Uh, yeah. what, what sensor are you looking at? Um, Hyoman, you want to uh, mention that? Yeah, uh, it's a Stefan, Stefan Meyer uh, flux gate. It's low cost magnetometer, which costs about, I don't know, like $300, $400. Uh, I think it is originally made in Germany, but I think we do, I, I believe that there's actually a, a US vendor who, who uh, carries that uh, product. So I. I remember I purchased that through a U.S. vendor, but I think it was originally made in Germany. Yeah, and there, there are actually two versions. There's one that is a triaxial and one package. That's a little more expensive one, but it looks like there's a, a second option, which are three single uh, axis magnetometers. They appear to have the same specs in terms of noise and sensitivity, same power supply voltage and so on which can easily be integrated. And that's, a little, that's about half the cost of the triaxial unit. But there again, and you know, you, it'll be a few hundred bucks. Yeah, but they, I think yeah, you have to build some kind of packaging, I think. Yeah, that's correct. You'd have to do the packaging on the three. Yeah. But, the, mm -hmm. but it, either, either one of them would easily fit into a PVC pipe for underground uh, installation. Yeah, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm particularly interested because I've used the Barton, um, what is it? Um, oh, shoot. Bartington? Um, Bartington. Yeah, I keep me uh, mixing that up with Bartolini, which is a guitar pickup. Um, Bartington, um, we've flown that on rockets and uh, balloons, but that's considerably more expensive. I'd be, I'll be interested so, to see the resolution it, of the. It, it, interestingly, I don't know how, but uh, the, the sales manager or whomever that is at Bartington found our Hemsite workshop presentation. And actually he reached out to me specifically saying that, oh, we have this and this in product. And if you're interested in, you know, please use this and stuff. And he actually, he's the one who actually gave me a specific information about the a product that they are actually developing right now. Uh, the product information has not been released yet on the website, but he sent me some spec sheets and stuff, uh, which is pretty comparable to any science grade magnetometer, but for lo much lower cost. The, um, but it's such, I think that's more expensive than Stefan Meyer magnetometer that I just mentioned, uh, but I don't know, it's a Bartington, you know, it's, it's bigger company, so I'd probably their packaging should be much fancier. Um, but uh, he's, going, he's supposed to come back to me uh, with more detailed information after the sales department decide you know, how much they're gonna sell. Um, so yeah, that's where we are right now. That's how I got to know about this new product that uh, he just mentioned. So. Oh, very interesting. Well, we can yeah. talk about that some more later. So David, would you go ahead and uh, I seem to have skipped over you I'm not, or you were a little late. Go ahead. Well, I was late. Uh, hello, everyone from uh, Chincoteague, Vermont, uh, Virginia. Um, I'm at Wallops uh, for the next week or so, doing integration on a sounding rocket. 
which is a VLF experiment. Uh, so I'm particularly interested in all of these. We also fly magnetometers on these guys. Um, so that's what I've been doing this week. Um, I'd hope to get to the uh, um, FPGA interface question, but just haven't had time. But I'll be interested to see if we've made any progress with that. Back to Nat. Fine business. And next on the list is uh, Con Tran. Go ahead. Hello, all. Uh, well, I'm still learning um, radio. Played around with um, GNU radio a bit. Uh, that was pretty cool. I really like that. And uh, the big project I'm working on now, it's um, I'm going on a road trip in like a couple of weeks and I'm, uh, I'm building a, 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 yeah, I'm configuring a, a mobile SDR system uh, on my um, Jetson uh, TX1. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Back to that. Very good. And next on the list is John, KJ6IBP. Go ahead, John. Um, well, uh, at first I plan to do mostly uh, listening and learning. Um, I was at the last meeting, um, at the last meeting that I attended. Uh, uh, that stuff is a little uh, beyond my programming training. I can't really help there. Uh, but in the future, I plan to set up equipment and uh, share data. Well, that's good. Welcome. And we'll have plenty of opportunities at all levels, so don't worry. So next on the list, we have Michael, AAAK. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you, and greetings to everyone on the conference. Back to you, Dave. OK. and. Next after that, we have uh, KG6MKI, just monitoring. And then we have Scotty, WA2DFI. Go ahead, Scotty. OK, thank you, Dave. <clears throat> yeah, this week has been uh, spent uh, either trying to recover from my awful cold or working on the clock module and the data engine. We had a couple new revs. And uh, maybe in the uh, general session, I can show the uh, placement. We're, we're pretty close to a final placement on the clock module and uh, it ends up about 40 millimeters square. So pretty small little guy about yay big. And uh, let's see, uh, yeah, getting psyched up for the, uh, the ham conference was looking to help out on the, uh, the ham expo this weekend was a little disappointed. I didn't get to help out because it sounded like it'd be a very cool uh, setup. So Sorry to miss out on that. But other than that, I think that's it for this week. Back to you, Dave. OK. And next on the list is Tom, uh, N5EG, not the last this tonight. Oh, good evening, Dave. Thank you. Good evening to everybody. Been a busy week on email. Um, talked with uh, Dave and a few others on the uh, protocol and programming. I think we have some clarity there now that maybe was missing before. So made some good progress there. Um, we had a bunch of emails on the BLF receiver tools. And I think we got a couple issues out and we still have some things to talk about. And then Scotty and I worked through the uh, receiver interface to the FBGA. And I think we have a, an agreement there on what we probably need to do. So uh, just a lot of email, but I think it was productive. So back to the group. Yes, well, and the last on the list is Veronica, KD2HUHN, sorry. All good, hello everyone. Um, I've mostly just been working on my poster and meeting with Dr. Purcell and Bill Lyles and Dev, um, that's, that's about it. Well, good luck with it. Thank you. And I think that brings us to the end of the list, unless somebody was missed. I, I think I got everybody. We have 21 participants tonight. So we're open for general discussion. Great. If you'd like, I can talk a little bit about, a little bit more about the data. I would go ahead, ideas. yes. Yeah, so uh, as I said, what I was thinking is that 
right now we're still in this phase where we're building the hardware and um, Bill is very busy developing the different tools that we can run on this thing. But there's going to come a time where we're not able to run everything simultaneously because of computational limits and because of bandwidth limits and we're going to have to make decisions. So I think what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to, we're going to want to come up with some sort of a common mode that if nothing else is going on, this is the mode that the Tangerine will run in if it, if it is acting as a personal space weather station. And that common mode might be a blend of different things. For instance, we might have it uh, listen for an ionogram um, you know, every two minutes. We might have it consistently monitoring WWV on certain frequencies. We might have it also consistently monitoring FT8 or whisper because we really want to um, monitor that H the HF ham radio propagation, not only for the science project, but also for the benefit of the amateur radio operator. Um, during certain times, we might come up with some modes where we want to, we have a campaign. So we might have, Christina might want to run a festival frequency campaign and she might want to have everything running in the same mode so that the tangerines match what the grapes are doing. And then hopefully we can press the switch and then all the tangerines will just focus on doing the WWV monitoring mode for that time. Now, exactly what, and then, and then it would return back to normal. You might also have a case where we could do um, what's called a triggered mode where you see something like the KP index uh, skyrocket or, um, or we sense a solar flare and we have it do a, a special high time resolution mode where maybe it's taking more oblique ionograms than usual. I don't know exactly what this is going to look like yet, but it's going to be some blend of these different things. Um, similarly with the VLF, at, when we're getting closer to the point of we actually have something working and we're starting to collect data, then I think we want to have some of the different scientists and, and community members get together and say, okay, what are the things that we want to do? What, are the, what is this thing capable of in terms of compute resources, in terms of bandwidth that people are going to have? Um, what, what can we run? And I think we'll start coming up with a common mode and there'll be some debate about that. Um, so that, that's a, the general thought um, for the personal space weather station mode. Uh, Nathaniel, I could yeah. uh, kick in a little short discussion of what we've got working already, if, if that would help. Sure, that'd be great. Um, what we have running on the local host already, uh, using a simulator as a back end instead of the data engine while waiting for that for hardware. We have it uh, already set up to where it can run in several modes. Number one is a ring buffer, where it's, it's configurable to uh, the size of the ring buffer. You can configure it to take up only so many gigabytes of space, and it just erases the oldest stuff. The idea there is that it would run continuously, but it would uh, check in with the host every few minutes as in a heartbeat. Uh, and if the, when I say the central uh, host, that's a central command system at University of Alabama. Uh, if the, if the uh, super user, the science super user had said, oh, we want the last hours worth of data because it was a solar flare or whatever, uh, it would, uh, when it checks in with a heartbeat, it would get the command to do an upload and which would give it the bookends of the date times it wants to uh, upload data. We are, that already works. Uh, another mode of operation is something we call snapshotter, where that can run uh, at the same time as the ring buffer mechanism. And what that does is every about every 110 seconds or so, it does a high resolution uh, FFT of the spectrum. And then that is saved as a CSV file. And then you've got your choice as to what you do with that. So you can take a look at the uh, different uh, spectrum grams uh, as, as quickly as we can save them. Um, and then uh, we have uh, the ability to collect FT8 and whisper data. And today we're decoding those and then we're uploading spots to PSK reporter and whisper net respectively. Although we, we're talking about, we might work with Rob Robinette on, on interfacing with his system. Uh, although 
Ryan's current system is very oriented towards the one of those small Kiwi receivers or something. So there, we'll have to reach an accommodation on that. Um, but uh, you can also run, there's several different kinds of modes, which I call the fire hose mode. Um, if you have your tangerine on a local area network that has a very high speed, very high capacity server on it, uh, we would do what we call local fire hose, where the local host uh, basically tells the data engine, okay, here is the address of the server you're gonna send everything to. And it just vomits the, the entire spectrum uh, on, and you know, you, it, it's gonna take gigabits per second to do that, but we have the ability to do that if, if somebody wants that. And another one is what I call remote um, fire hose mode. Uh, and that is basically continuously uploading uh, up to the central server at UA uh, spectrum data. And uh, you, have to, you have the opportunity to, to control the amount of bandwidth that it con consumes. Um, typically to get spectrum data where we're, where we're looking at Doppler information, um, typically you want uh, something like around eight uh, kilohertz of bandwidth around each thing you want to monitor. So five channels of WWV, and you don't need those all the time because some of those stations you don't hear at night or during the day. So anyway, we may have to have some kind of a scheduling thing on that so we don't overload the central host. But uh, anyway, so we have a, a, a number of things already lined out and in fact already working. Um, and I, I'm sure that we're going to add more and maybe find out some of the stuff we've done so far wasn't really that such a great idea so we'll do something else but that's what we have so far as the first first out of the gate and bear in mind now this is version one of this thing uh mm -hmm. we're we're trying to design this thing so that you can do all kinds of weird stuff with it like put multiple data engines out there and multiple local hosts and share them and and but but for, for phase one in order to actually get something working for the nsf we've uh, we've selected what we think is an achievable package of of scope uh for the functionality so that's that's my brain dump on that i think I, that's i would like to chime in that bill has written a wonderful uh little article for the tapper psr describing a lot of this stuff yeah that they, that is basically I, I know there's been a lot of discussion in forums on how to to get IQ data off your flex radio. And there's never really been a cogent explanation of how to do that. And that basically that's what I wrote was a, an article on. It's basically how I did the simulator <clears throat> for the data engine for this project. And uh, it's not available yet, but it will be in the next sometime week or so. I don't know if Scotty knows, but uh, I have seen a, a proof uh, of it and been able to read it. It was quite good, Bill. Thank you. I'll offer that, uh, uh, I'll offer that um, when in our AM Doppler system, we actually do a double FFT. We um, bring out each of the, in our case, we bring out each of the uh, AM channels at a high sample rate. Um, but then since we're only interested in the Doppler information on the carrier, we narrow that way down to just a couple of Hertz or so. And uh, the data rate goes way down when you do that. Yeah, well, we can, we can do that. Although I must say that we had, a, we had a lot of discussions with Nathaniel about that. And right now our thinking is that there's so much information can, if you take a look at the what happens at some of those, at, when you look at what the Doppler actually does, there's all kinds of interesting features. It's all kind of structure to it. It's not just, well, um, the frequency simply goes here and then goes there. No, there's well, all kind of interesting stuff that goes on. I know, well aware of that. But yeah. the, uh, the amount of uh, spread is limited. And um, we currently do it in the Raspberry Pi, but, uh, you know, if you can do it in the FPGA, that would be even better. Maybe we can get it in there. That's, 
Uh, that's above my pay grade to decide that. <laughs> Well, that is that we, we, we left the format open-ended enough that we could add that format, that very narrow band format, as, as a future stream if we wanted to do that. Right. Just like pointing also, out that it can be done and is being done, and it doesn't take a whole lot of computer power. So, um, just like, like Bill was saying, we're focusing on the, the first set of features so that we can get something out the door that works, but, but, not, but not restrict us to being... to, to being only 40 kilohertz or wider. Right. And I know the AK data rate gets the entirety of the uh, WWV modulation, which may be useful. Yeah, we were thinking that was useful for, um, for some disambiguation to make sure you're seeing WWV and not WWVH. Uh, that was one, one of the reasons for doing that. We're also, I know, um, uh, Steve Serwin has also been looking at what things you might be able to, what information you might be able to get out of the sidebands additionally from just the carrier. The other thing I wanted to say about the data um, or the control system management, like what the experiments would be, I had a few other ideas on how we might manage this. Um, one idea is uh, to look at the super darn scheduling system as a model. So the super darn, the super darn radars, there's about 30 of them around the world and they're not all run by the same people. They're each funded by uh, different countries um, and they're run by different principal investigators. And yet they have a common mode agreement where they agree for so many hours a month, they run in a common mode. And then for so many hours a month, uh, the individual investigators are allowed to choose which mode they want the radar to run in. And so in doing so, they've, they've come up with a system where they are able to have the whole system work together as a network, but still give some flexibility in terms of individual um, investigators, what their curiosity is. That was one thought I had. Another thought was to run it... Um, the incoherent scatter radars like Millstone Hill that Phil Erickson runs, uh, they have um, a world day program uh, where what people can do is they can write a proposal to say, I would like to, I'm interested in running this experiment on all of the radars at the same time. And then there's a committee that reviews them and then grants that time. So maybe once a year uh, or on a rolling basis, we could take uh, experiment requests from people and potentially plan them out to do longer campaigns. Um, this is also similar to how people would get time on, say, the Hubble Space Telescope. People would apply for a particular experiment, and if the committee, you know, thinks it's a good experiment, and if there is a time to run it on the system, um, it would run that way. So um, there's there's a lot of different ways to run it, and then the people who are also running it, they would have could have a certain amount of um, discretionary time to figure out how to run the network. Uh, I have a question for Bill. How much of the SATNOG scheduling information did you hang on to? You mean how much of the code? You were using SATNOGs as an example for uh, the prototypes of this, right? Well, yeah. I mean, Basically, what we wound up doing was um, just taking their lead and basing the thing on Django and Maria DB. Okay. Um, as far as the scheduling, uh, we don't have a solution for that yet. Um, I mean, scheduling right now it's it's dirt dirt crude. I mean, all we're going to do for for phase one is give a couple of science super users, the ability to request uh, a download from the ring buffer and do a, do a couple of other simple things. Uh, what we do in the future uh, is, I guess it, it's gonna boil down to what we need to do to support the science. Yes, I, I was just aware that they'd worked quite a bit on their scheduling because they're following satellites. Yeah. And yeah. That's a, a more restricted problem than what we have. But uh, we may be able to take clues from their software as ideas of how to, to create a database of 
of times available and requests. Yeah, that's that's a that's a great idea. Um, I, I don't know if that, that that would be within it wouldn't be within phase one scope. But you know, if this thing is as successful as what is shaping out to be, <clears throat> it's entirely possible that NSF would be interested in doing follow on projects after this yep. first phase. That's what we hope for. Yep. Well, that that explains uh, quite a bit. Thank you, everybody, for. Um, um, giving me a, a better idea of, uh, of what's going on. Yeah. Um, so, so with and, that, um, I would like to uh, uh, offer that um, VLFRX Tools has a lot of utilities available right now um, that can um, uh, basically decimate data. So I would like to make the argument that um, captured whistlers and captured chorus uh, is something that would be useful to have on a database. Um, also, uh, lightning location. Uh, each each VLF receiver or Tangerine SDR can upload through RSync or LFTP um, um, CSV files of of time of group arrival data, and using that. And, and some um, location information, uh, another utility uh, can spit out latitude and longitude values from that time of group arrival data in a CSV format. And then um, there, there isn't such a tool, but there's, uh, you could do some sort of visualization tool like a worldwide lightning location network or Blitzertung um, that can create live maps of um, lightning data. And, and this is all, all low, low bandwidth data that uh, I would make an argument that, that can be constantly uploaded to the um, database. Uh, over time, of course, it'll add up. Um, but I, I think that these would be valuable things to have, um, at least to start out. Um, so, um, that was, that was one of the things that I was concerned about. I was, I was trying to understand what the parallels would be with the HF data. Um, so, uh, now I have a better understanding and, and, and I, um, and it, and it seems like a lot of the limitations tend to be with, with the fact that the bandwidth is that, that the, um, data bandwidth is very high and you can't have all these receivers uploading gigabits of bandwidth um, constantly. So um, since the VLF data is, is much smaller bandwidth, at least with the vents and lightning location data, you could probably have that um, being uploaded all the time. That would be like oh, the yeah. normal mode. Oh yeah. Yeah, we, one of the things that we're designing for is that we're anticipating that a number of users are going to have simple DSL internet. And uh, a lot of people are feel lucky if they get five megabit bandwidth uh, on there for, and well, that's for download. Upload tends to be more like you about seven, 700, 800 kilobit. Uh, and that doesn't work well for uploading any, any significant amount of data. Now, having said that, we were employing some tricks. We found a way to do certain quite a bit of compression on the data within digital RF. That's a built-in feature uh, and, and a number of things like that. So there's kind of a balancing act there. But of course, as time goes on, when everybody starts getting connected up to Starlink, why then the world the, the world comes sky's the limit. Yeah. And I, I think what Jonathan is saying, uh, Jonathan, so first of all, I want to point out I very much appreciate all of your input because you absolutely have shaped a lot of the directions that we've gone that we're going here. Because if it weren't for you, we wouldn't have a VLF board coming up. And you know, you've sparked off a lot of good discussion about VL, um, VLF RX tools, uh, which I think was well received on the list. And I do believe that you know having a diverse set of low bandwidth, constant monitoring modes makes a lot of sense for um, the personal space weather station. Because if we can get 
information back from the magnetometer, from the VLF. You know, our WWV monitoring mode is a low bandwidth mode. Um, I, I think that is very valuable information that we can do a lot with for just routine monitoring of the space weather environment. So I, I think those are excellent suggestions. And I definitely think you should continue to advocate and give us those ideas because I think they'll be well received. Yeah, I, I um, thank you. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I uh, uh, feel that um, 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 the capability of adding VLF receivers, especially uh, triple axis reception, um, and and having a global network of them, and tools to decimate and understand the the uh, data. Um, if I was a VLF scientist, um, I would want something like this and at least to have a, a open database. You could probably have this public since it's such low, low bandwidth. You could have Whistler events and chorus, um, lightning location. You could do um, plots of amplitude and phase of VLF receivers. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, sit, sit events, um, uh, a lot of what uh, the people on the VLF group, uh, groups that I'm, 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 I'm a part, part of is they, um, they uh, monitor um, the phase and amplitude of VLF transmitters for um, SIDS. Um, and, and that has, has uh, been a, a lot of posts that I've seen and also amateur work in VLF, the uh, Dreamers band and lower frequencies. If we have a, a network of VLF receivers, um, we could actually understand propagation for people who want to do uh, QSOs. Um, we could do um, um, uh, uh, EBNOT modes, the, the uh, a mode that uh, Paul came up with to uh, transmit um, characters. Um, we could do carrier mode and, and a lot of, and, and amateur VLF um, can, can come alive when you have a, a network of VLF receivers out there. And it could be a lot more fun and you'd have a lot more, more people doing VLF transmissions because now they're, they, they know that there's gonna be um, someone on the other end listening in at least maybe they're sleeping but that data will be recorded on the database so um that's why that i wanted to uh, mention the amateur um vlf aspect as well with this now you're talking sub 100 kilohertz Yeah, um, initially, uh, many people started out with uh, around 8.7 kilohertz, and there have been experiments at 5 kilohertz, um, and lately there has been uh, some around um, 260K. Uh, um, so uh, initially it was 8.7, but they're uh, starting to experiment a lot more. And they're um, and when they do character transmissions, they uh, want to see how many characters that they could transmit and uh, if it can be uh, decoded. And here I thought it was just tinnitus. <laughs> I I would like to break in here and uh, mention Gus uh, N6UQ has joined us and also uh, Joe W7LUX just for the record of attendance. Good evening. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So you ready for uh, the clock module uh, progress here? I would say go ahead. 
Okay, let's see if this will actually work. So this is the, uh, <clears throat> the um, second pass, not so preliminary drawing, assembly drawing. This is the top level, top layer. And uh, the three SMAs along the side. And uh, maybe I could start out better by uh, looking, uh, there's the sizes right there. So you can see it's pretty small. And uh, this is the, this is the uh, high performance GPS U1 here over on the right, which is the uh, dual band. Um, it's the uh, ZF9T from Ublox. And then directly under it on the back is the, is the footprint for the Neo ones, the, the more inexpensive ones. And so you would actually solder either this down or the one on the back side, one or the other. You wouldn't solder both of them down. <clears throat> then um, the uh, TCXO is Y1 right here. And it feeds the transformer and then the jitter reducing uh, uh, clocking part and then the synthesizer, which is U4. And then we've got 10 differential pairs that come off of U4 down to the connector down here. And the SMAs are for uh, one pulse per second, 10 megahertz out, and the middle one is for the uh, remote GPS antenna. It's an active antenna. We actually have a, a bias T built on the board so we can supply power to the GPS antenna. And uh, what else do we have that's uh, of note? Um, this up here, this J11 is a, uh, a uh, UFL connector, UFL? Yes, yeah, a UFL connector that allows you to, if you want to change a couple of resistors, you can actually feed in your own TCXO or oven controlled oscillator or whatever reference oscillator you want that uh, will be fed into the synthesizer eventually through all the, the normal regular chain of processing. And then uh, let's see, I think I have the. Scotty, is does that uh, jack switch? Or how do no, you no, disable no, the, you the to, on board? You have to change resistors to do that. Yeah, <laughs> rather have a, some kind of switch or jumper. Yeah, you know, that's a good idea. I'll look at that because it seems to me that I did a design before that had a, a non stub switched UFL that you could just plug in and it would switch the, uh, the source. Right. So let me look at that. I think it's worth uh, investigating. Otherwise, you do have to change the resistors because we really want to prevent stubs in that line. No, of so, course, but uh, it would be nice to be able to switch yeah. it in, um, just plug it in, and um, yeah. at most uh, flip a jumper, not go in and with a soldering iron. Did you see this right here? I don't know if you can see this. This this is uh, two O four O two resistors that are laying over the top of each other. Yeah, I know how that works. Yeah, so you put this resistor in for J eleven. And you take that out and put this resistor in for Y1, and then that picks the clock with basically no stubs at all. Yeah, I don't know that I would re recommend it, but I know that um, the uh, at least the older cell phones had a switching jack for an external antenna. Yeah, I think there is one that you can get, so I'll I'll, I'll look that up. That was a Motorola radio, because that would be useful. Also, eliminate two resistors, which is useful. Anyway, the backside is here. So you can see the thing is pretty well full. I mean, it's uh, these are end launch connectors, by the way. So these will be grounds. And then the pin will be over here on the other side. The center pin will be the, the active output or input. And so this is the smaller GPS, the Neo version from Ublox. The real-time clock battery backup. And then most of this here is just bypass caps and bulk capacitance. Because uh, on the outputs of the synthesizer chip, they really want, they want 470 microfarad on each output. Well, 470 microfarad are big capacitors. So these barely fit on the backside. We're going to have to make sure that there's clearance on the data engine for these parts around the synthesizer chip. So that's, and actually that's what the CAD guy is working on now. We wanted to get this nailed down pretty well where it's going to be. And uh, then we can place it over the CAD. We use the, he's got a CAD drawing on. He'll place it over the data engine 
and we have a CAD drawing for the data engine and we'll see if there's any mechanical interference and move parts around appropriately to make sure there aren't any uh, interference issues. This GPS is only two millimeters high. We have uh, 4.11 millimeters in between the boards when they're placed and in and locked down. So you can see the, the battery I think is two and a half millimeters, but that really only leaves space on the data engine for things like uh, bypass caps and things. There's a few ICs that are only a millimeter high or less, but a lot of them are higher than that, which so you can't stack them then, which is unfortunate. <clears throat> and uh, here is a, uh, is a rat's nest version of the, the top X-ray view. <coughs> so you can see these are color coded. So uh, the olive color here is ground. Uh, the pink here, the, the, the hot pink is uh, differential pairs. And the uh, GPS, this is the GPS antenna, comes in here and runs straight across here to the two GPS antenna pins, which are right adjacent to each other. So this is pretty critical because this is at one and a half gigahertz. So even microscopic stub lengths are not good to have on that line. So we tried to arrange it so that the antenna pins are as close to each other as possible. And again, you'll have one or the other of these. So it, it won't be a stub with any load on it, but it will be a stub off of the line. And um, I think that's about it for that. It's, it's, it's pretty much nailed down a routing guy, our PCV guy thinks he can route this. So it'll be very dense. And uh, we're, it's going to be a six layer board is what he's proposing. So Scotty, the, uh, <clears throat> the powered antennas, are that, is that standard? Uh, the powered GPS antennas, are those a standard thing where you can just grab up whatever power GPS antenna you're using for something else and well, use it for this? Pr pretty much it's standard if you get a modern GPS antenna. And I think John said every one of the dual band antenna, dual frequency antennas he's looked at uses 3.3 volts, which is what we supply. And we have a current limit circuit and an ESD protection circuit on the output here. However, that said, we have a header, which I believe is this header right up here, that will allow you to feed in external GPS antenna power for antennas that are not, that are older ones or not standard ones. Yeah, there's a very standard uh, timing GPS antenna, uh, multiple manufacturers, at least multiple brands, um, that is five volt only. I've made the mistake of powering it with 3.3 and it doesn't work very well. <laughs> so we do need to have the capability of supplying five if we can. Yeah, yeah but you will have to feed it in externally here. It's not jumpable to five. But so. other than that, there are a lot of them available, but like the things that'll attached to the top of your car generally will do yeah. three, three volts. And again, we're looking for the dual band ones, which is a much more limited class of antennas. Yeah, you do need to be able to power those, but most people will be using just a single band antenna, I expect. Well, I would not expect that if they're going to buy the expensive module here, because this is, they're going to be- No, if they this. buy the expensive module, yes. Yeah. But I'm saying that most people won't buy the expensive module, probably. Okay. Anyway, we do have a provision for that, so. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. You said it's pretty crammed in there. What about heat buildup, Scotty? Have you figured that out? Well, the, uh, the heat uh, generating devices are typically the U4 here. Let me go back to the, it's gonna be this guy here and to some extent the GPSs. And the GPSs are rather large. And what I was just talking to John about, what we're gonna try to do here, this actually, this oscillator is the TCXO. And it's supposedly highly temperature compensated, but of course, the less temperature variation you can put it through, the better off you are. So we're talking about actually isolating the ground connections, the thermal ground connections underneath it to prevent conduction. And it's far away from U4. This is gonna be the big heat generator. And we're, we're, I don't know where the heat source is gonna be on this module because um, it, you can't really get a spec on what the current consumption is because it varies depending on whether it's booting or whether it's uh, what it's doing because it's got a processor in it. So I don't know where the heat generating parts are inside here because this is a hybrid. So it's got a, it's got a can over it. So the heat might come out down here or up here or it might spread out evenly or 
and and but this is about as far as we can get it away. So what the idea is in an emergency where if we determine that this is not going to work because the GPS produces too much heat and we have to get the oscillator away from it, what we do is we plug the oscillator into this jack and we move it off the board if we have to. But that that's really mechanically messy because you have to have a place to mount the board then and you have to have a place where you can run a cable to it. What you do is you buy a, uh, a these cables are not that easy to make. I don't know how I would make one myself. I would buy one with the connectors on it. So you buy a jumper and then you would, we'd have to build a small board that contains the TCXO and mount it somewhere else. Got it. This, this board is not laid out, it's not planned to be operated vertically, but rather horizontally, is that correct? That's correct. Right, so there will be no heat flowing upwards from U1 and U4 onto Y1. In fact, the heat would flow upwards or out of the page from U1 and U4, therefore drawing ambient air into you into the crystal and then over towards U1. So in fact, well, they, they may not heat it too much. In oh, that they, no, it'll also be flowing through the planes. Planes are heat sink. Right. right. It's but also that's we're sandwiched gonna, between heat sources, is it, is it not? That's what we're going to try to uh, eliminate or minimize is the, is the heat flow from the plane up into the oscillator. This oscillator actually consists of a, you can kind of see it here, it's a crystal oscillator with components on it and it's mounted on a piece of FR4. So it's already double layer. And then we're going to isolate the internal ground plane of the board around this oscillator and make a single thermal, yeah. basically a thermal to it to prevent conduction into the oscillator itself. You're Except not actually going to limit the uh, ultimate temperature excursion. You'll just uh, limit uh, it how quickly it changes. Right. And the other thing is if we can get any airflow at all across this board, it's it will definitely make the temperature be lower because it doesn't take much air to, to lower temperature if you don't have a lot of actual heat being produced. I know we had uh, the uh, Max 10, I mean, the Cyclone 5 board that we did for uh, SDR on the IQ2. Um, it would get noticeably too hot for your finger to be to place on it when the thing was operating. But we put a stick on heat sink on the top of it and we had a three CFM fan. I mean, you're talking about a little a, a guy like uh, 20 centimeters, 20 millimeters across, very, not even an inch across. And it was so quiet, you could barely hear it. You could, you could, if you put it up against your cheek, you could feel it, but you couldn't feel it with your fingers. And it was amazing. It was enough to drop the temperature radically because it, it would accumulate the heat and get hot, but it didn't really create a lot of heat, a lot of heat flow. It didn't require a lot of heat flow to cool it down. So I guess we're going to find out. And I'm, I'm guessing that when you put this whole thing in an enclosure, you're going to need some kind of fan. There's, I don't think there's any way around it because you're just going to have to. So, and it may be that we use the, uh, an extension of the leaf connector to supply the fan. We actually do have a fan connector on the tangerine board, but we have to mount it somewhere. And I'm thinking we're going to aim the fan over the FPGA downward and let it flow out like this. So you're going to get flow. By the way, the FPGA in this board is right over here, but not underneath the clock module, but adjacent to it. So you're going to want to keep that heat away from this clock oscillator too. So you're going to want some air blowing away from things. So it'll be dependent on where we put the fan. And yeah. of course, when you stack boards up, then you block the airflow. So this, this is actually a better solution, I think, than what we originally had because it was going to end up being partially over the FPGA, so not, not as good. Yeah, the difficulty, of course, is in some situations, um, you want maximum airflow, and in others, you want it sealed up tight so it doesn't freeze. So it's a, right. it's hard to know the actual thermal application. Yeah. And so this really, none of the parts on this board are really uh, that power hungry, even the Max 10. Uh, it's not, when you, get a, when you get the Cyclone 5 CVA9 with 300,000 logic elements, then you're talking about heat that you got to get out of there. But with only 50 KLEs, uh, it's, not, it's not as big of a deal. In fact, the A to Ds on the, um, 
RF module will dissipate more power than the FPGA is, is likely the case. And they're, of course, on the back side facing outward. So <clears throat> they're going to have, they will be able to cool those perhaps. I, I, we haven't really thought about the overall cooling. And uh, day to days do get hot. Um, uh, Flex Radio had the problem. They use a stick on uh, heat sink on their A to D's. Yeah, it got so hot it melted the adhesives and the, and the heat sinks fell off down into yeah. the electronics and <laughs> that generated a, a product recall for them. So that yeah, that's, I, you gotta watch out for that. I heard about that. The, uh, happened to mine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Happened to uh, another friend of mine's too. So, but yeah. So if you, if you use the stick on heat sinks and you get the proper adhesive and you can you keep the temperature down, it really doesn't take a lot of airflow to keep the temperature down. But it does take some, so we have to figure out a way to channel the air. And I know on the IQ2, we kind of we fit the boards so that in the chassis, it, the boards were uptight against three sides, and there was a gap against the fourth side. And then we blew the air downward, which I know is counterintuitive. You really want to blow it outward, but what I wanted was outside air blowing right on the hottest part. So it blew in inward on the heat sink of the FPGA, and then it flew flows along the the receiver board with the hot ADC, which also has a heat sink on it. And then it flows down through the slot to cool the bottom, which is the transmitter board, which really doesn't have very much heat generating capability. And then it flows out the bottom. So it kind of flows. We, we kind of channeled the air because we only had three CFM. So we really didn't need very big channels. And I'll, like I said, all we needed was just a little teeny bit of air and that was enough. And it is amazing too because if you don't put the if you didn't put that fan on there, you put it in the case, ten minutes it overheats, doesn't run. It actually will will throttle back and not perform properly. So, a good lesson to learn. So, we're getting closer. And uh, the, I tell you the data the the CAD guy's first answer. Originally, see, we had, see this notch here? This actually, this notch is for the, the um, leaf module, which is, it will, will go, they'll be like this. One, oops, if you can see my hands. The leaf module will be in the upper right, clock module will be in the lower left. And originally this part, this board was um, to the left of this hole was where the board edge was. And the CAD guy emphatically just said, it's not going to work. We can't do it. You can't put both GPSs on there. And so I kind of cajoled him to put some of them on there, put the two big parts on there. And then there was just this whole boatload of parts sitting off the board that there was no place to put. There's no, no, no space for them. And so we ended up extending this as far to the north as we could, because right up here is the USB 2 connector on the data engine. And below here is the RF connector that goes to the RF, one of the RF modules. And this is the left side of the data engine board along here. So all of the connectors come off that side. <clears throat> the clock mod, or try the leaf module is this cut out here. And then the FPGA is the big guy right along here. And I told him you can't put this board over the FPGA because you can't block the airflow to it. So you can see we are, and, and so what we did is we, I gave him that outline and he said, it's still impossible. So we went in and we just stripped out all the possible parts that we could. We changed out all the SMT uh, headers, jumpers, because the SMT jumpers come down like this. And so they're much wider on the layout. So we made them through hole to save space. We made them all two millimeters instead of 10th inch center jumpers. We went through, and if you I don't know if you can see, uh, let me go back here. This part right here, I don't know if you can see that down by the lower SMA. That's a that's a six pin gate that is a uh, heck, a Schmidt trigger. So this is equivalent to a SOT 23 type part that has a single gate in it. Well, we put an SO14 on there to start with, with the six gates in it. And the SO14 is like the size of both of these parts together. And so he says, there's no way it's going to fit. So I went back to the data sheets and I picked the smallest package I could find 
And so you know what's going to happen now. The CAD guy will lay it out, and then my my manufacturer is going to be just giving me what for for picking such small parts that he, he's going to have trouble laying them out. But these are six pin parts, and they're incredibly small. This is only millimeter by one and a half millimeters, the size of this part. This is an 0402 part right next to it. And this is a six pin, I, uh, it's an IC gate. And, and yeah, to lead a little, show a little perspective, these parts here are the 47 microfarad capacitors. These are like 12 tens, okay, which is normally, that would be considered a big part that you could solder by hand. And you can see how many of them I have, and they're scattered all over the board. I even had to put one out here in between the connectors. So he did a pretty good job, I think. Now, when, when we get to laying it out, we'll really see you know, what compromises we actually made that we don't like. Because you're going to see bypass capacitors too far away from their pins, and you're going to see, you know, traces that are extended out far, way far away. But you got to keep it in perspective that these SMAs are a half an inch apart from center pin to center pin. They're a half an inch that distance. So when you say, oh my God, look, the trace runs from there over to there, I mean, it's only a quarter of an inch. So it's really, you got to get it into perspective because when the board is only 1.8 inches square, there's not really any place that's very far away. But even that said, the differential pairs still have to be routed next to each other and they have to be routed the same length because they're all clocks. So they got to be the overall the same length in each pair. So this is why he earns the big bucks and I let him do it because it's hard. <laughs> it's, and he's been doing it for, let's see, since about 1988 or 89. So like over 30 years of, of layout. This guy is the best layout guy I've ever worked with. So if he can't do it, then oh, you might as well give up. New country. Uh, you know, it, it seems like uh, there's no chance of anybody ever actually working on this to modify it or repair it. Very it, little chance. There's so always small. What we've tried to do, there's a couple pins that we that are um, variable, and we've tried to make it so that you can adjust them or, or change the state of them by pulling a part off. Because I found it's much easier to pull an 0402 part off, which usually means it gets stuck to the iron, it burns up, it flies across the room. You don't you take one off and move it, almost impossible. But I could take one off, okay. I could take it off with a pair of dikes, just cut it in half. So if we can make the mod something easy to do just by removing a part, then we, we did that. So for instance, on the, um, the uh, jitter reducer, there are low pass filter pins that are digitally selectable. So well, originally we had four pull up, four resistors, two pull up and two pull down. So, cause we don't know what the filter is we wanna select yet. So we're gonna figure this out and then we're gonna put the resistors on in production that match the filter that we want. But in the meantime, when we're trying to debug this, we got to change 0402 resistors. So I put jumpers on there. Well, the CAD guy says, no jumpers, they're too big. You got to get rid of those. So what I did is I put pull-ups on the pins and then pull down zero ohm pull-downs. So now they are both low and whichever one or both you want high, you just snap out that resistor, that zero ohm resistor, and then it goes high. So you can do it even without a soldering iron if you're careful. Scotty, are there any unused uh, outputs on the FPGA that you could use for configuration with that? Um, no, there's. I'm I'm way short of I/O. Yeah, because the thing is, are smaller the thing, than resistors, and uh, well, we have a lot of things are configurable in the FPG or in the GPS and in the synthesizer that are configurable, and they're configured by the I2C port from the FPGA. We have both an I2C port and an, a UART port going to all these parts on the board. But the low pass filters we figured are most likely something that you're not going to change, not if you keep the, the clock frequency that we have, and not if you use it the way we're going to offer it. But we want to be able to change it if you, if, if you really want to. We're, we're going to make you really want to change it. It's like the uh, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? Well, only one, but the light bulb's got to want to change. Well, I've changed out 0402s, so oh well. Yeah, 
and, and the other problem is it's going to be really packed as you can see it's it's not going to be easy to get in there these are tall also and these are not so it's but i i just there's not really anything I can do about it because this is what fits. This is the size that we have to work with. And so we, we tried to make it as flexible as possible and give you the, as many options as possible without using your soldering iron. But there's just going to be some uh, assembly required if you want to do exotic things. Like if you want to, uh, if we can get this connector chain, so it's got a switch in it, that'll eliminate that. But the low pass filter, you're going to have to solder to, to change that. And i um, thinking there are a couple of things that we've, we put two millimeter jumpers down here. There's uh, the GPSs have external interrupt inputs so that you can actually get the GPS to timestamp inputs, these hardware inputs that we routed down here. But John says he's tested it on the uh, evaluation board. He says it, it kind of works, but it doesn't really work very well. So he's not really excited about anybody bothering with those inputs. But we put them there anyway. And uh, let's see, what else do you have for, uh, oh, we also have uh, this six pin jumper here. This supplies uh, uh, I2C port and power and three and five volt power and ground. So you theoretically can power the entire board off of that header for debug purposes. You don't need any M.2 connector. You can power the thing up and you can scope it out and, and program it over the I2C port without having anything else connected. So that was one that John wanted on there. And then we also have the GPS, the, the high-end GPS has a second serial port. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that's used for, but you have access to it on this four pin header down here in the lower right. So we've tried to go through every pin combination, every use case that people would want and bring the pins out. And when you plug this into the header or the, the carrier board that John's going to decide next, <clears throat> there's a lot of IOs here that don't go to anything on the data engine, but they go to the connector because you might want that for another feature. So the, the carrier board that John's gonna develop is gonna be able to take this card and change it into a lab grade uh, frequency standard kind of, uh, I mean, GPS DO for your shack. If you don't, if you're not interested in the tangerine at all, but you are interested in clock, high high performance clocking, then you can use this. Not really standalone, but it's an, another use case for the board. So, like I said, we've got actually have ten clock outputs that come down here to the M.2 connector. So, you've got lots of extra I/Os if you want to use this board for a different purpose. Well, the data engine only uses four of them. So that's kind of the overview. Um, Stani, the um, when when the when the GPS receiver loses uh, loses fix or um, uh, doesn't have a uh, good um, uh, signal, it's that TXCO that that um, keeps everything running, right? Yes, it's the TXCO that will do the holdover. And uh, John's going to have a whole lot of lot to say about holdover uh, this weekend at the HAMSI uh, conference. Okay, good. He, yeah, he's, that's one of the big concerns that we have. And there's, there's not really a good solution to that. But there's an okay solution. Yeah, and, so yeah, I was, I was, I was wondering about that too because a lot of people, when when they set up these VLF systems, they have they they have these GPS modules, but they don't have any holdover. And I was excited that this would offer at least some sort of holdover that would be a little bit better than the than the holdover uh, from the stock GPS receiver. Um, that would that would be a uh, a um, really nice feature. Yeah, and I'm 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 not sure how John is planning to do that. That is something that we are planning to address, or he's planning to address. So, best to listen to his talk this uh, this Friday and ask him that question. Yeah, it's actually built into the synthesizer chip. 
the holdover function is in inside the chip and the TCXO um, uh, runs it. The synthesizer chips got some registers that track offsets. Uh, and so when it goes into holdover, the TCXO runs it from the last hold on the synthesizer registers. That's my understanding. Oh, wow, nice. So you, you do get something for your money on the fancy GPS. Looks good, Scotty. Like Scotty says, uh, listen to John's talk for the detail. Yeah. I've got to drop off here, but it looks good. I look, look forward to seeing it get routed. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I have, to, I have to get off here too. So uh, I just wanted to show this, that, that everyone that we're making some progress here. This is great, Scotty. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm looking forward to playing with it. It's going to be uh, pretty impressive. I can't wait either. This is gonna be awesome. I think it's actually gonna happen. Do you remember, <laughs> yeah. Scott? Do you remember when you first met me? Yes. What? what it, how do you? It, it, remember? it was a DCC, wasn't it? No, I, I think I actually first met you at Hamvention. I, it, I think, I think like in maybe 2015. No, I I remember it was in the uh, the break room, the food room. And I got you confused with one of your students because I thought there's no way you could be old, that old to be a professor. No, I, I think <laughs> I, I think I met you before that, but I don't think you remember. I okay. I remember I remember running around Hamvention one year. It might have been even before like Hamsa was actually a thing, and I was in a scout uniform running around. Oh. And I and we were just starting to like brainstorm the idea for the Solar Eclipse QSO party, and we were looking for replacements for the red patayas. I think I ended up at the um at the tapper booth and i think i think i i think it was you that i talked to because um you know i, I think you had like the b micro because you you have the yeah. b micro right so i think you had those there and you were demoing them and i was yeah. talking to you i was like oh you know it might be neat if um I, we could make like a custom one at some point someday yeah, look where we are now <laughs> and now here we are <laughs> But that was just like, I mean, back then it was, I was you know, I, I had nothing back then, but now here yeah. we, are, we are doing this. So, so this it's going to really be good. Cool. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Very, very excited. Thank you. Okay. Mm. I have to run. So seven threes, everyone. It was seven three. Um, yep. Take care. Good meeting. Yes. Thank you. Seven three. I I need to go as well. So 73. See everyone uh, either Thursday or Friday. 73. Great. Okay, guys. 73. See you then. 73. 73. So, who do I talk to to volunteer to get involved in all this? Just keep hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> if I remember, I'll be back. <laughs> yeah, no, the way people kind of join is they just join these telecons and then they figure out how they fit in. So some people have like, you know, lots of skills with, um, I don't know, precision timing. Other people are good with, um, you know, magnetometer things. Um, they just kind of figure out where they fit in and they just <laughs> step right up. <laughs> Right now, the best place I can see is, is the local club here. I can get to, to do some things. We've got a pretty good financial base and some space with clubhouse so we could set up something there and, and have, you know, yeah. one of these tangerines and whatever else it takes to get this working. That'd be great. As you can see right now, we're still, so the funny thing is uh, we, we're still very much in like a development phase. Yeah. Yeah, so, see, so we don't really have any real hardware to give anyone yet. So no, what about this grapes? grapes well, so the grape is interesting. Um, and actually, Joe, W7LUX is on here. Um, he, he is one of the people that might be helping us to get, um, at least make the grape available as a kit to people. So we have a grape version one that mm -hmm. you currently... We do have it so you can currently buy the board off of OSH Park and you can buy all the parts and you can put it together yourself. But yeah. we don't really have it set up so that anyone can support it yet 
in terms of if someone has questions or how to do it. But we do have one person who can do it. He's a guy who designed it, but he's also busy di designing version two. So we so don't I'm gonna, want- I'm gonna help out with that. Yeah, so Joe's gonna help out with that. And I know we just started that discussion in the past week. Um, so, I mean, if you want to kind of help out with supporting that as well, you know, I'm sure you can jump on the bandwagon right now and learn how to build one of these things. And then that way, if we have a, a few people who know how to put them together and what needs to be done, then it's not a hard job for any one person. Where does one go to uh, get one of these boards and get parts list and stuff like that? Uh, I should be able to tell you right now. Um, let me bring it up. It's on GitHub. And John did respond to your email. Uh, I don't know if you saw that. I've got a schematic of the uh, prototype. Okay. And I, have, and I have a question about that too. <laughs> All right. I don't know. If, let's see. I think I can tell you where to find things, but I don't know if I can answer the schematic questions. So if you go to github.com slash hamsci, there's this PSWS documentation. And then he has grape gen one and he has the ordering list in here. So there's now a supplies list dot PDF. And so Okay, so there's the supplies list. Does he have the actual board on here? Um, if we go hey, to- Can you scroll uh, uh, back up again so I can grab the screen? And- I can put the link to this in the chat. And okay, I, I should have a screen grab of it. I'm, I'm not familiar at all with GitHub. Okay. Um, there's a so GitHub is a code repository system. Right. So actually, right here, this is I'm putting in the chat right now. That's the main link to the repository. And you can actually, if you click this green button right here, you can download the entire folder as a zip. And then you can just. Um, you anything you want here. Okay, well, I have a schematic and looking at that, it's um, comparing the local oscillator with uh, received WWV, and then it outputs a low frequency AC signal. Where does that signal go? What analyzes um, that data? That goes to a sound card. Okay, it goes to a sound card. Yeah, so I should have, um, Yes, it just goes to a, a sound card that plugs into the Raspberry Pi, a USB sound card. Okay. Over here, um, I just put this link in the uh, chat. This is where you can actually buy the board. Okay, that's over on the right, that uh, oshpark.com. Oh, yeah, slash okay. profile slash any OB. Oh, that, that, that call sign looks familiar. Yeah, that's John Gibbons' call sign. Yeah. yeah. So he's he's, he's at the a, Case Western. Yeah, he is the engineer at Case Western. He's okay. the designer of this. Is there only two is, hours? Is this, is this current board going to be fairly stable or are there going to be major modifications somewhere in the future? This, for version one, this is it. Okay. There will be a version two that will be different, but for version one, this is it. Okay. There's already a, about 15 that. of about 15, 15 of these out there running. There's one actually at my feet running right now. <laughs> so, is and then all it is, um, so the grapes, I should check on mine. Um, it's just running FL Digi. I've not logged in here, okay. So this is my grape running right now. So I'm using VNC to connect to the Raspberry Pi, uh, which is running FL Digi in this frequency analysis mode. 
Right. I, uh, I've done that many times. Yeah. And so John has a, um, he has a, a Raspberry Pi image that has all of this pre-configured on it. Okay. And he also has scripts in here for, um, you, you need a special script to change the frequency of the Leo Bodner GPSDO. So he has those scripts predefined. And he has a number of other scripts on here to do housekeeping and automatically plot things. <clears throat> um, all in well, here. I've been able to measure <clears throat> down to a hundredth of a hertz uh, using uh, FL Digi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it's good. It, it's giving us these nice single line plots. So it's not going to be what we do eventually, but it, it works for now. The problem, the problem with eventually is that um, any one of those plots, it's easiest to show you in a, a figure here. So that. Um, if I go to Steve Serwin has done a tremendous amount of work. Uh, this is his Tapper DCC paper. I think he has, right. So here's the example. So this is what you get out of FL Digi here. And you get all this variability. Well, the reason you're getting all that variability is because the actual WWV spectrum splits up into multiple paths and you get multiple spectrum traces. And the FL Digi algorithm is going to be jumping between these different traces. So in the future, we're just going to be recording essentially raw wave or IQ data, uh, about eight kilohertz of bandwidth. But for now, we, we have it configured just to do FL to G. Hey, Nathaniel. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned earlier about collecting data and you did mention Christina's name. I would reach out to her. I volunteered to collect data in the last eclipse. Mm -hmm. and she, she quarterbacked that and she did a really good job. So. Oh yeah, no, I, I know. And, He's doing uh, great work. Mind you, we, we collected for 24 hours and then uploaded our wave file to her server. But so it wasn't a continuous upload, so. Yeah, no, I, I know. Um, I, I work with her, I, I talk with her at least once a week every Thursday morning. Yeah, I knew that you did. I just thought yeah. for the data collection, she's a really good resource, so. Yes, very. She, yeah. she did an awesome job on that eclipse. Yeah, no, she, she's done, she does really fantastic work. Did you hear the podcast that she yeah. did? Yeah, when you sent the link out there, when someone sent the link out this morning, I, I listened to it right away. Really cool. Yeah, really, really good stuff. So I'm going to yeah. volunteer for the next eclipse too. So it was a lot of fun. That's wonderful. Yeah. So um, let's see. So Bill and Joe, does that, answer some of your questions? Yes, yeah. it sure does. Um, I, I learned more. John's pretty doggone busy, but he did send me a schematic, and that's, okay. uh, that's a very good start. Is yeah. it worthwhile building up a version two or is version, or I mean version one or is version two so close so much it's a way for version two to come out? Um, I don't expect to see version twos coming out before six months. Yeah, okay. So at least, or maybe even longer. So, so we need to get people uh, going on the, on the version one. Yeah. Yeah. I think John's behind on the version two design. So that's why and people are kind of chomping at the bit to do something. So that's why we're kind of going this route where, okay, we have, we have this put together. Um, it's not, you know, perfect. It's not everything we want it to be, but it, it does what, It'll, it'll keep people involved. And this is something that is buildable, you know, whereas, you know, John said that you really can do this with just a, a soldering iron and a steady hand. Whereas um, the, uh, 
you know, the tangerine, uh, it, as they were saying, you're just not going to be able to build that on your own. It, it would bother me a great deal to uh, solder down one of the expensive modules on that tangerine board <laughs> and have to um, uh, buy a new board for some reason. That would be terrible. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is a, a better th this is a good way that people can get involved right now and make precision frequency measurements right now at a modest cost with a, a little bit of involvement. How much is Ethan Miller involved or is he just on an advisory board and kind of name only? Um, I, I chat with him. I, I email him, you know, maybe a couple times a month. So to see what the college just down the road from us. And we'll, I kind of gave him a kick in the butt and got him started years ago. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's, the, he's the one that introduced me to reverse speaking network. So yeah. I, I first met him on my way to ADAC Island back in, I think, 2012. So yeah. then we've been friends ever since. He's been around the block once or twice. So. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he's a good friend of mine. I've been, I've been to Adak Island and to Svalbard with him. Yeah. I said, I watched the video today from Svalbard. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was a good trip. So yeah, we, we did a CQ world prefix CW from there. Yeah. That, that, that was so fun. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> that was really, really fun. Yeah. That was, uh, that was something else. I remember that year I went to Hamvention one weekend and the next weekend I was off to Svalbard. So it was wow. <laughs> quite the year. And and earlier that year I was down in Antarctica. So I was like, it would it was so <laughs> much travel that year. It was just much more travel then than now. Yeah. Yeah. But it was it was something else. Well, I might say 73 for the night then. Yep. Well, if thanks for the uh Okay. Nathaniel, before you go, yeah, uh, I I have a uh, quick uh, question. Um, since I have, um, I'm having some trouble trying to get uh, KiCad working on my Mac. Mm -hmm. um, I know that. Well, it looks like that Scotty did at least the uh, placement layout for the uh, clock module. Mm -hmm. um, w would it be possible for Scotty to um, work on the layout for the VLF module if I were to give him a schematic? You can certainly ask him. And um, if he says there's some sort of cost associated with it, uh, he can talk to me and we can try to work something out. Okay, because um, it's a really simple it's a very simple board, very simple layout, and it's 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 probably something that he could do in a in a uh, um, couple hours. And I, I uh, just just couldn't get get the um, uh, any anything working on my on my Mac to um, um, do any of that. But if if uh, Scotty can do it, and if it's simple, I would imagine. If there is a cost, it would be low, and and since there's some extra, I don't know how much extra money there is, but since there isn't any travel and there's some extra money, maybe that could be used for for his layout. And I'm sure that he would do a, a much better job than I would anyway. Yeah. So no, no e email Scotty and ask him if he doesn't do it. You know, maybe um, I don't know if it's something that Tom McDermott could do, or you know. So one of the volunteers might be able to do it. Okay. All right. I will do that then. Yeah. That would be good. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to head out. Uh, you uh, yeah. have a good night and I will uh, see you Friday. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everybody. Right. Thank Seven you. Three. Seven three. Seven three. Looking forward to the weekend. Me too. Thanks.